Hello everyone. Uh, the vision of Charles Chen Yidan is to create a better world through education and the mission of the Yidan Prize is to change the world by acknowledging the change makers. And we are so privileged to have three such outstanding change makers right here with us today. Lucy Lake and Angie Murimira from Comfort and Professor Carl Wyman from the University of Stanford. So my heartfelt congratulations to you to the 2020 Yidan Prize. You received this prize for educational research, helping the world to better understand what works in education and for education development, putting great ideas into practice to give more people better education opportunities. And if we can, can connect those two worlds, we can indeed create a better world through education. So my congratulations again. And I want to give you a warm welcome to this session and we are looking forward to learning very much for you, from you. Thank you for joining us. So I'd like to start by first talking to the team from CAMFED. Um, we are very honored to have you with us as the very first team to win the Yidan Prize. Do you, what do you think are your strengths together as a team? And how important has collaboration been in building CAMFED? Uh, thank you so much, um, Dorothy, for this. Um, our strength as a team is built in us as individuals at the beginning, because this is about us celebrating and embracing each other's unique but complementary contribution. And, and secondly, we have a clear and shared vision of where we're going with this, what we're trying to achieve, and why it matters so much. Besides that, we have a very clear point of arrival for the next five years as, as a solid example, and we did a very clear direction of, of travel. And, and thirdly, you know, what makes us so strong as a team is that we have a very sacred, non-negotiable accountability to the child, to the child we serve. And it's not just in ensuring that resources get to them, but it's also ensuring that uh, they are tangible and measurable results of our work together. And to the question around uh, collaboration, we are who we are today as an organization, doing what we are doing and at the scale we are doing it because of collaborating. It is the reason we boldly declare ourselves as a movement revolutionizing how girls' education is delivered. I'll quickly share three things that collaboration has contributed to building comfort as you all now know it. Number one, collaboration has enhanced our local ownership. This is local ownership of our intervention, of our model, of our approach. We partner with families, communities, governments in eliminating barriers to girls' education and women empowerment. Secondly, collaborating has given us unmatched access to a rich social capital. This is not just in terms of the diversity of the people that we partner with in this, it's also in terms of the numbers. So by the end of 2019, we're working with 290,045 community activists across five countries and 161 districts. And thirdly, collaborating has kept us responsive adaptable and relevant in responses to needs and lessons emerging from our work. So without serious teamwork and unwavering commitment to collaborating would not be where we are today. Neither would we have the audacity to set such audacious, ambitious targets we are making in this season as an organization. Lucy, over to you. Thanks, Angie. Well, just to pick up on that, and thanks Dorothy for the, Dorothy, for the question. Collaboration really is at the heart of CAMFED and who we are. Um, it's what binds us and our core governing principle that Angie mentioned around accountability to the girls and young women we serve um, is really central to that collaboration. So it means that every decision, every action in CAMFED at every level is pushed through that lens, that principle of accountability. Um, and it means we don't refer to the young people we work with as beneficiaries with all the implied power dynamics. We refer to them as our clients who we serve, who we're accountable to. And it means we, we don't um, predetermine young people's outcomes. We don't pretend to know what's best for them. We're there to unlock their potential to be the change that they seek. 
And similarly, as Angie mentioned, we don't approach a partnership with a community or indeed with a ministry with a predetermined blueprint for a programme. We engage together as partners to define a pathway to achieve mutually agreed outcomes. So that core principle of accountability and the, and the value system that it fuels has been key to how we've built CAMFED. And as to our strength as a leadership team, well, I think between Angie and I, we bring a breadth of perspective, a real 360 approach. And I think we show by example that you can come from very different backgrounds, from very different cultures, but you can be united in common cause and valued for the unique contribution that you bring to that cause. And I think that's an important message in the, in the fight for social justice. And if we're to dismantle structural inequalities, we can't do so from silos or from opposite sides of the road. We have to be prepared to cross the road and come together. And Angie and I do that, and we're unflinching in holding each other accountable. And our leadership model, I think, means that we are greater than the sum of our parts. It is quite unique, but it shouldn't be unique in global organizations. And I'm really thrilled that the IDAN Prize has brought a spotlight to our leadership model. And I hope that as a result, others will be able to follow in, that, in those footsteps. Thank you so much. That was enlightening. Um, structural inequalities can only be overcome by embracing our diversity and working together. Thank you, CAMFED. I hand over to my co-facilitator, Andreas. Yeah, let me turn to you, Carl. The natural sciences where you began your career are a field where teamwork in research is absolutely vital. And it's also seen by everybody to be vital. Some scientific experiments involve hundreds, if not thousands of researchers. They share their knowledge across different fields and they work seamlessly across national and cultural borders to achieve great things. But you know, why do we have such a hard time with teamwork in education research? Research in education remains highly fragmented, often insular, sometimes disconnected from the real needs of real teachers and real classroom. Sometimes education is still more like a cottage industry where you know we build our practice on traditional wisdom. What can educational research learn from research in the natural science and how can we do that? So I think this is a good question and it's actually one that I've thought a lot about because I straddle these two areas of the physical sciences research and the education research. And so the contrasts are are direct, you know, very clear to me. And I mean, since I came into education research from the physical sciences, I just naturally in my own education research incorporated what we think of as kind of basic practices. Now, I don't work in collaborations of a hundred or a thousand, but I certainly do. All of my projects are two, at least two or three, you know, students and postdocs and me working together. And to be honest, I really can't imagine doing it any other way. I mean, it just the, the value of having another, you know, another brain, another set of eyes, different perspective, giving you different insights, critiquing your, you know, your work uh, is just such a fun, you know, when you're used to that, it's such a fundamental uh, value and uh, helps the work so much uh, that it's just you couldn't imagine doing anything differently and so it's still strange to me to talk to my Stanford faculty colleagues in education where they'll have one student working all by themselves on one project and I just think gosh that how, how could that be how unsatisfying how difficult that, that would be and and of course you can't tackle nearly as difficult problems as when you have three or four people working, bringing their independent efforts and knowledge and skills. So uh, I think that in some ways, I'm hoping that this is just kind of a, a, a growth and evolution, but it's certainly a big problem with the culture. Um, I mean, another example where I think we were very successful taking the the larger team collaborative approach is the, the FAP 
project we're developing these online interactive simulations for teaching science that are now used millions of times a day um, and a big part of why that was successful is that um, rather than working with a few isolated people trying to do things in very small groups we realized to do something on this scale successfully you had to bring together you know good software engineers to do the fancy computer coding. You had to bring to, uh, in the science experts to really have the content right. You had to bring in the science education researchers to be able to measure that they were really effective. And you had to bring in the teachers who would be using this in the classroom. And each of these had plays an absolutely essential role when making something like this successful. And if you didn't have each of these components that you'd be missing, you know, it'd be like a table with a missing leg. And so I, I do think there's tremendous value in this. And I, uh, but then I'll relate one last story about this, which is um, at a retreat of the Stanford School of Education a couple of years ago, they were talking about the tremendous challenges in education. And they each had their little research projects, but they'd always, about, but they were limited what they could do because they looked at this aspect, but there were all these three or four other factors, you know, the school organization, the teacher training that were, played such an important part and they couldn't de uh, deal with that. And so I said, well, look, you know, you're making this out. This is a very big, complicated project. Physical scientists faced that and they made these very large collaborations, figured out how to divide up and were much more successful. And I, you know, the reaction was I, I might have, might as well have suggested they grow two heads. They were just, you know, the, and it was just completely incomprehensible to them. And so, you know, I take away from this, it's really an issue of culture and the, the way people are used to working at th on things. And I think such cultures uh, just change slowly and in the, and one of the things that I work on, and I think others are, are trying to expand the thinking about how one does educational research to look more at what's the scale of the problem you're working on, and then can you put together teams to address that in a more effective way than what we've been doing in the past. But it's not, you know, it's not going to be a quick and easy thing to change that. Thank you, Carl. I think you have a great and important mission in the Yida and community actually to change that culture and to help us look upwards to other fields and other ways. And with this, I hand back to Dorothy. Thank you, Andreas. Um, coming back to the CAMFED team, one of the most exciting things uh, about your work are the learner guides. And I really would like to know what role teamwork partnership play in um, developing and implementing the learner guides and who are your key stakeholders in that whole process? Sure, thanks Dorothy for, for that reason. And uh, just to say that uh, the learner program, the learner guide program by its very design is teamwork and partnership in action. And it's an embodiment of those two key components for maximum impact. It is about young women high school graduates who are the learner guides rallying communities to respond to the needs of the most marginalized children, the learners in their midst, holistically. So it is, it is about a partnership. It is a collaboration from the learner guide with the, from the learner rather, with the primary beneficiary of the intervention to the central government whose systems are targeted for improvement. So it is about partnering and teaming up with everybody for the greater good. It is designed to get everyone committed to know better, to do better, and to be better. We collaborate in and for, for everything. I was, I was like listening to, to Professor Wyman, they talk about, you know, when you're used to this, it's, it's very difficult to see how else you could deliver this without collaboration. So we collaborate immensely at all levels from 
content development. What is it that the learner guides are going to cover in school, how they are going to cover it, how often, to training delivery, how their own training is conducted, monitoring and support of their work, to adaptation and adoption of the program for wider use by the government. But also, most importantly, it is not just about learner guides delivering to children. It's also about um, supporting learner guides to respond to the learner's needs as they interface with them. Because at times this then results in home visits when a child has not been attending school regularly, or material support when a child is in need, or linking children to critical service providers, for example, for bereavement counseling. So just to say it is the teamwork and partnering of stakeholders in the learner guide program that guarantees that the learner we seek to support is not alone, neither is the learner guide who is at the front line in engaging the learner. And that's why we've got the unprecedented results that we have got. Let's see, please come in. Sure, Angie. Well, I mean, just picking up about your point in terms of the, um, the, the breadth of stakeholders who are engaged and, and you mentioning um, communities and, and ministries there. And so just to pick up on um, some of the other stakeholders who we've brought around the table in the development of the Learner Guide. Um, social enterprises have been one such partner in helping us refine the kind of incentive, sustainable incentive, incentive scheme we can set in place for Learner Guides. But also importantly, the private sector who we've worked with in developing the, the self-development curriculum that Learner Guides deliver in schools, as well as the qualifications that they can receive. And I think you know, reflecting on um, the success of those partnerships. I think one thing that's been fundamental um, to the success that, that underpins the Learner Guide program has been a recognition of where the expertise lies. So we've brought on board technical experts and um, experts in curriculum development, experts in um, the development of wellbeing resources, and that's been, been a, a fantastic partnership. Um, but the real expertise that we've focused in on has been the expertise of young people themselves on the challenges they face. And I think what's really come to the fore has been the importance of valuing that expertise, recognizing that many of these young people um, have been exposed to school textbooks that generally reflect um, young people who may be in urban areas better off, which means that the young people we're working with you know, are continually reinforced with a sense of other and better, which really undermines their self-worth. And in the kind of surveys we've conducted, we found that the second highest reason for school dropout among girls was low academic self-esteem, that they were really feeling disaffected and disenfranchised in the classroom. So when we work with technical partners in developing the curriculum, and um, they of course agreed and, and recognized the importance of consulting with young people, but we really pushed that and turned that around to say, no, it's not about consulting with young people, that they will be your editorial committee. And um, so it was that, that process of positioning the expertise that I think was fundamental to the success that we've seen in the program in really being able to develop meaningful materials that dismantle that sense of other and better and that really focus in on the, the concepts of autonomy of voice and empowerment. Um, and as a result, I think as a result of that mutual recognition and respect for young people's expertise, We've seen um, the, the results in their greater confidence in their academic studies, a greater belief um, that school is relevant to their future. And I think the, the partnerships that have underpinned the Learner Guide program, I think um, are an important reference point for others in thinking about learning teams and thinking about how we can bring others in to support the learning journey, especially for the most marginalized young people. Thank you so much. Um involving young people and the design of their educational content and its delivery wonderful uh, over to you andreas thank you carl um, how can we help the next generation of education researchers to collaborate more and work together to find tomorrow's big educational problems that you just mentioned and uh, also to build a bolder research agenda that really advances the frontiers of education so, I mean, these are, of course, things that most education researchers <laughs> think worry a lot about, and I don't think we have any good answers. Um, but we have some partial answers at this point, and I uh, take some heart in actually 
in the work that inspired me to go into this field, which is uh, looking at, in some ways, a very narrow slice of education research. It's a um, very narrow slice of the education uh, universe, really. It's looking at, at introductory physics and higher education. And that is one area that you can point to where research has really changed practice quite substantially. And you ask why, you know, what happened there? How, how did it happen? Well, first was, it was a fairly narrow slice. And so you can, you have a much simpler system, you know, for thinking about the, your, your research space. Uh, there are just many fewer variables in that. You can try different ways of teaching, you can think about different ways of learning, and you can get much cleaner, simpler results than what you can do if you go out and try and study, you know, grades K through six across 50 states in the, in the country, let alone multiple countries. And so, uh, so part of that was being able to get good clean results about this is what matters and comparing this way of teaching versus that way of teaching provide much better learning. But then there's another really important aspect and it, it couples with what uh, we were just hearing about uh, first, you know, bringing in the student voice. And in this case, I would say it's bringing in the student voice or student minds and the minds of the teachers that you want to impact. And so a lot of this research I look at as the, the, the work that's had the biggest effect, it wasn't just looking at what was an interesting, important research problem. It was looking at what is a research result which is going to be compelling to a teacher to make them do something different than they've been doing in our case for hundreds of years in teaching introductory physics. And that was to really do studies that brought out how students uh, are thinking in quite rational, sensible ways. They have these capabilities and yet they can still end up not learning what we hope. And so what, was to, what the research looked at was measuring aspects of learning that you might argue weren't the most important things that could be done, but they were the most important for making a compelling argument to the teachers. They were things that the teachers thought, oh, every one of my students should learn this. In fact, in many cases, they thought they were learning it, developing good assessments and data to showing, no, you aren't understanding how your students are thinking. If you understand, here's a test you can give that will reveal that. Those results reveal not just the problems with the students learning in the way you were teaching before, but then also demonstrated this isn't just some deficiency in the student. If you teach the same students this different way and have experiments doing that, then they learn much better and much more. And so it's really a, this combination of finding, I think, clean systems where you can get good convincing results, measures that you have that are quite revealing, and measures that show that teaching differently can lead to substantially better results on, on, on things and the learning that the teachers care about. And so those, um, you know, that's a narrow space. It's now broadening across higher education. But again, we're really changing slowly. I admit I, you know, spend a lot of my time being frustrated and running around <laughs> trying to proselytize on this, but, but it is very definite progress on changing how teaching's done and more importantly, how people are thinking about how learning happens. And I think um, it, higher education is, I'll admit, a small part of the great edu education landscape, but it's a starting point. I think we, and we, it's a starting point, we have to start there and we see how to do it there. And then as we change 
as people go through that system and as we change how the teachers that we're training are thinking about teaching and learning in a different, better way, it can be uh, spread more broadly. Yeah, you've done really amazing work to use science to understand how people learn science and to also build a better evidence base that help educators to move away from, you know, just teaching how you were taught towards teaching how scientific research really teaches you to teach science. How do you think, uh, how do you see your work shaping educational practice? You know, how, how can it help Angie and Lucy in their day-to-day -day work? We have to bridge the you know, work between researchers, but also how do we bridge that gap to educational practice? Well, I mean, but that, that is where the research really has to, I, I mean, I, I look at the, the research uh, as <laughs> taking my science background, I mean, in science, we go from fundamental science principles about how things function to engineering design. We build new computers based on our understanding of how electrons, <laughs> you know, interact. And so I see this as uh, very much the same sort of thing. I, I, and I oftentimes, I'm just putting things together. I'm taking the results from cognitive psychologists and how they understand about how the brain really functions and learns and then seeing how do we apply that into the translate into what we do in the classroom and with what activities uh, you know design there that'll be more effective um, and of course worrying about the many many variables that you have to get Cor correct to do that. Uh, and it's frankly easier when you have a lot fewer societal and institutional variables to learn how to do it first. But then we're sort of building on that and saying, okay, now we can move into a, we understand it in this situation, we can move into a more complex environment, sort of incrementally understanding the factors and, and controlling them, recognizing it, it's a complicated system, but uh, it's not an impossibly complicated system. You just have to to systematically sort through the, the issues. Yeah, thanks so much. And perhaps it's also about, you know, mentality, the way we approach those issues. Thanks, uh, Dorothy. <laughs> well, it's proving to be a very fascinating conversation. Um, looking at practice. And I want to ask you a little bit about how you organize on the back end. Um, you know, you're a great team. You've managed to get people aligned behind very ambitious goals. What do you do when you're recruiting new team members? How do you effectively onboard them so that they can uh, actually be behind those goals. And then um, your organization is dedicated to ensuring that young women have the best opportunities possible in their education. How do you address these gender roles? And obviously there will be cross-cultural differences. You're working in so many different countries. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Are there any men in CAMFED? Uh, okay, thank you so much, Dorothy. Yes, there are men in CAMFED. Uh, we are about justice in education with men. We are fighting poverty and exclusion with men. It's not a war against men. <laughs> All right, just talking about uh, our, our process for onboarding new team members. We, we recognize as an organization that onboarding is, is a process. So, of course, there is the standard, uh, you know, orientation policy, which sets out minimum standards. You know, I think that's, you know, like standard, everybody would be aware of that. But on top of that, for us, one of the unique components we bring as an organization is ensuring that there is peer support and mentoring from day one for you know, individual new staff members that come on board. And they also like have an opportunity to learn by doing and learning alongside others. They go to the grassroots, to the people that we work with on the ground, at the forefront and engage with communities so that they understand and put the theory in their head that they probably had in the orientation meeting initial one, 
you know, to understanding and alongside, you know, trusted staff members and everything that could help them with that. But I also just want to say what's, what's been very important for us, particularly talking now about cross-cultural differences and gender roles, is our respect for differences. We, we realize we are different. We are not the same. We, we do not advocate for separation of that difference. And this is difference of sexes, of gender, of cultural groups, of ethnic groups. We, 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 there is that acknowledgement and the conscious understanding that women are not a monolithic group, neither are men, neither are Africans, you know, Zimbabwe, Zambia, neither even Zimbabweans within Zimbabwe or Ghanaians within Ghana, they, they are different people. So we recognize and celebrate and embrace that. But amongst our team, there is an openness to making others aware when something is culturally inappropriate for you. There is that openness and respect and trust that this person's intentions are okay, but you know, this is offensive for me because of A, B, C, D, and E. We made that a learning process, an understanding process. And what has helped that is our shared vision, our shared approach to say, you know, by the end of the day, we are coming together to do this. This is the most important thing and we are agreeing and we're in agreement. I also just want to say then with communities that we work with, and I just want to touch on that a bit, is that we, we work on ensuring that there's deliberate, meaningful participation. We're talking about you know, going beyond putting words or names on a list or putting women on a table and saying they are fully represented. It's also about ensuring that we engage with the historical imbalance that exists and ensuring that you know, we, we support and empower the young women or the older women to be able to participate as equals. We also work you know, with, within our you know, learner guide program, we work on what we call powers. So we also work with boys to build the you know, power of empathy, which is unheard of because it would, normally boys are supposed to be dominant, boys are expected to be, but we work with that. There is a whole curriculum module which talks about empathy and why it's important. We also talk about assertiveness versus dominance. So I just want to say that there is a deliberate acknowledgement of privileges within the communities that we work with and a commitment to working together to transform. So I just want to say that it's paid off. You know, we have emerging and relentless male champions for inclusion and systemic change. Quite recently, one senior chief in, in Zambia, senior chief Nkula, allocated a piece of land to our Association of Young Women Leaders in recognition that traditional land is passed from fathers to sons. So we're getting there. Lucy, mm. over to you. Yeah, well, Angie, just to pick up on that point and, and, and in relation to onboarding and yeah, I mean, from the outset, we've, we've involved all those with power and authority in relation to girls' lives, including patriarchal authorities, to your point there, Angie, about the chiefs, because we recognize that we can't expect girls to succeed in a vacuum. If, that we, if we're really serious about shifting girls' prospects, then we have to shift their context. So the question became one of how do we bring everyone along with us? And Angie mentioned chiefs, and I recall one senior chief saying that as a result of his engagement with CAMFED, he said, I now understand that girls are like refugees in their own motherland. So really building that understanding of what exclusion means um, is critical to bringing everyone on board and along with us. And in relation to ministries, I think really bringing an understanding of the experience of the poorest, most marginalized girl and recognizing that that is a barometer for the system as a whole, that she will be the first to fail in a system that fails her. But if, that we, can, if we can push up standards to the extent that she can succeed, then that's going to be signal of, of quality for all. And just on a, on a final note, I would say that girls' education is often cited as a silver bullet because of its impact on um, economic growth, on um, population, on climate change. But I think if we flip that the other way around, that girls' education can be misunderstood as a kind of mitigating factor for a nation's and the world's problems. And we, we can't expect girls to take the burden of responsibility for a broken system. We need to see girls' education as a route to changing those systems and really recognize girls' education as the precursor to a fundamental disruption of the status quo through women's inclusion and leadership, which will ultimately lead to system change. And I think if we lose the gendered dimensions of these issues, we, we really lose the power and potential of girls' education. 
And I think our alumni, the CAMFED Association, of course, of which Angie is a founding member, means that those with the lived experience can confront the challenges of inequality and, and they hold the credibility to lead change in the center, in the center stage. And that's when girls' education really is a driving force. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of onboarding and gender, um, Dorothy, that is fundamental to who we are and how we drive towards that system change. Thank you so much. And over to you, Andreas. Uh, if I could just make a quick point on one thing they talked about. Um, one of the things I've learned by making mistakes over the years is now when I bring a new person into my group, I don't hire them. The group hires them. They interview with everyone. That's a much more successful way to, to bring people in uh, for a variety of reasons than you know, them talking to me and I decide if I, if they're going to fit or not. Thank you, Carl. And let me challenge you with a, a bigger question even, you know, over the last decades, we've seen such a rapid increase in the number of graduates around the world. The, the world has never been as educated as it is today. But uh, also, if we look around us in the world, we see a growing disconnect, you know, between the infinite growth imperative and the finite resources of our planet. We have divorced the financial economy from the real economy. The idea of our gross domestic product has got out of touch with the well-being of people. We see that growing disconnect between the haves and the have-nots, uh, even between technology and social needs and institutional leadership and people, uh, governance and the perceived voicelessness of people. I certainly don't want to blame education for all of that, but maybe we should ask ourselves where education, whether education is preparing us for an increasingly interconnected world, a world that requires people to be imaginative, to question the established wisdom of our times rather than just to produce it, not to understand how other people think, whether as scientists or artists and how other people live in different cultures and different traditions. What can educational research do to help education systems prepare the next generation for their future, not for our past? Um, boy, that's not an easy question. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, a great deal of that really involves broader societal changes uh, and and as you point out, education in, in how different people think, different opportunities and so on. And I, I am going to you know, plead, if not ignorance, certainly no expertise in that area. I, I'm going to only carve off a little piece of that, uh, but it's one that I can speak with some modest authority on. And that's the the general problem of thinking within the technical areas uh, and you know science engineering and so on where we clearly need two things we need uh you know experts scientists to think in imaginative new ways to solve these uh big problems by scientific and engineering breakthroughs but we also need a, a much broader public literacy about science uh, in order to, to better understand uh, these massive global issues like global warming that fundamentally, you know, if you're going to have a society that's going to make wise and pain, somewhat painful decisions about uh, how we're going to live in order to survive this, you have to have not just good scientists, you have to have broadly literate uh, population as well. But when I look at what's involved in that public literacy or being a good scientist, I, what my group has been looking at now for a number of years is it comes down to making, how they think about making decisions. And so um, what you, what I believe and what I think our research is supporting is that you, you need to prepare people by thinking about teaching about science, for example, not by covering a bunch of content and so they can pass these various tests because in doing that, they're learning to make 
better decisions on how to score higher on a test. Whereas we need to, to make better decisions on, you know, what public policy to choose, what imaginative new direction to go in looking for novel energy sources or energy conservation, um, pro you know, problems like that. And so what education research can do, I think, is show how the different ways of teaching that really involve the students practicing making relevant decisions and the, it, and the knowledge, gaining the knowledge they need to make those relevant decisions in, let's, in the more, let's say, expert-like ways or, you know, skilled uh, ways is really what the, um, is really how, what we need to move forward. And it turns out, and we've done a little research on this, is this idea of being creative is even uh, something that you can teach quite easily. Uh, what we're really teaching, what we found, is we can just remove the anti-creativity part, you know, because if you think about the usual classroom, it's teaching them to, to the, teaching the student to be able to produce the answer that a teacher's looking for. That's just the opposite of being creative, which is producing an answer nobody else has thought of before. And so uh, giving students problems to think about where there is no clear, obvious right answer, it turns out even on small scales, we say makes dramatic differences to how creative they are uh, in thinking about new solutions. So I think that that's kind of my summary of thinking about the decisions you want people to make and then having education give them practice and feedback on making uh, those decisions is one of the key uh, things we can do to move forward more effectively. Thank you, Carl. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add? That I think for me, as, as somebody who benefited from ed an education intervention, I also just wanted to mention that it's the impact of such an opportunity transcends individuals and it transcends how communities and families perceive themselves as well. So I think just talking to the issue that, you know, around relevance of education, that matters in a big way. And it's always important to also understand user feedback. Because there were times when I thought that was this education system designed to fail me, you know, to do this earlier point that some of the examples given in there were so alien that I had no understanding what we we're talking about. So you end up having to kind of, like, you know, what you call it, cream stuff, and then you get to it. So it's, I'm just saying that, you know, it's, it's critical for us to embrace creativity, to embrace development in education, to embrace innovation as we go forward. But I just want to you know, appreciate the value of inclusion. That's not yes. ever. This conversation could go on for a long time because I think just picking up on some of the points Professor Wyman made and around creativity and teaching creativity and how one can unlock that in new ways within the classroom setting. I think that's been a big focus for us and within um, the context of developing the Learner Guide program. And I think there's a, there's a whole conversation to be taken forward there. And I, I think the, the Yidan platform provides a, a great, opportunity to be able to do that and to be able to do that um, with um, stakeholders from different parts of education to be able to come together and, and, and think about how that can be better positioned out into the into the global space and um, to really ignite more thinking in that in that direction. Thank you. Uh, one of the aspects that couples with the, the previous discussion is um, I wrote a recent article that's generating a lot of discussion, uh, some of it pretty lively, focusing on some of our research, which is really concentrated on showing how much of what is the, within certainly the science community is considered, you know, talent and how there's different levels of talent, is actually just been mistakenly, uh, or it's been mistakenly attributed to them, where it's just educational privilege. And that if we look more carefully, we see that different students are doing better uh, just because they have more privileged uh, educational opportunities early on. 
and uh, and that I've come to understand that this is really one of the big barriers to educational improvement is this concept of you can classify students and learners according to their talent and what that immediately means is that if they're low talent that it's a waste of time to spend much effort on them and you put all your resources on the high talent and this is really just a way of a kind of systematic discrimination and it's in our country and i think many others really just a way of of putting more benefits to people who have more money and can pay for better education. Uh, and we really have to kind of <laughs> reset that. And I think this is a place where education research can help by showing that these really aren't anything fundamental. It's only a question of educational privilege. That's why some many students, you know, much of the differences between students are uh, just arising from the, the privilege they've had in their early education. This has been a fascinating conversation um, across cultures, across continents, across disciplines. Uh, but what is very clear from everything that I've heard today is that it's a mindset that counts, a mindset that encourages collaboration, a mindset that allows learners to participate in the design of the content that's supposed to help them learn, uh, a mindset that allows constant feedback, and that together we have to embrace our diversity in order to address those systemic and structural deficiencies in our education. And this is what the Yidan Prize is all about. This is what Charles' vision, Charles Yidan's vision is all about. So thank you very much. And my thanks uh, from my side as well. And I can only second uh, Dorothy. This has been a fascinating discussion about working together in education. And I must say, people in educational practice seem to be somewhat ahead and fully capitalizing on the power of teamwork, your enthusiasm, Angie and Lucy, really shows what's possible when you have a clear mission and when you know that you can achieve that mission only if you bring everyone along with you. In education research, we seem to have a longer way to get there, to have people collaborate effectively. But it's great to have people like you, Carl, who are ready to challenge the status quo and who help us look at the big questions through different lenses and uh, perspectives. Uh, education research, as you have shown, can provide us with the tools to make education more inclusive, to enable and empower creativity rather than inhibit it. So thank you all for the work you are doing. You are such great examples for creating a better world through education. Yes, thank you all. Um, we are very proud of you as the laureates for the 2020 Yidan Prize, and we are looking forward to working with you and supporting your work in future. Thank you.